quick uh, video update um, on the Triumph. Uh, hang on, let me turn the camera around. Quick video update on the Triumph. A very bulk shock absorber. Painted the spring, that lovely blue, because I had a can of blue. Uh, painted the body uh, with an epoxy, VHC epoxy and the uh, rod end. I dressed up the uh, shaft, which was, uh, you know, it wasn't great, but it was certainly passable. Um, I put a new Viton seal in it and loaded it with 10 weight oil and hopefully with the valving it's got, that'll, uh, that'll work pretty well. It certainly felt good with the spring off. The damping felt right and uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I did a hell of a lot of polishing. Um, as you can see here, I'll get it so it's actually there. I did all this, um, all the triple clamps, the bar risers, the, and these handlebars are a pair that I had chromed for a job years ago and, and the guy didn't want them and so I kept them. And I think they're going to be pretty good on this job. Yeah, there's the bottom triple clamp. All polished up and looking good. New bolts everywhere, new high tensile bolts. Stainless ones in the top so they don't go rusty because, as you probably know, water collects in here and makes them rust. So I put stainless bolts and washers in there. Uh, these grips aren't going to be the ones on it. They're just so I can manhandle the thing around the workshop. I've got tons of those. I started polishing these but realised partway through the job that I'm going to have to modify them slightly. I'm going to cut this down, which is the indicator mount, and run these, um, I've got these Harley indicators that I got off a friend, they're brand new, um, late model hog indicators with these little mounts, which is quite nice and a good quality indicator, so uh, I'm happy to run those. As you can see, I've cleaned up all the stainless, I've uh, stripped all the paint off these, of these little wings, uh, the, the, um, the little clamps that hold the uh, headlight. I'll paint them eventually. I'll just get all this mounting stuff sorted out for the, for the, um, for the indicators. And once I've done that, um, once I've done that, uh, they'll be pretty much right. Uh, I just tried that one out to see how it went and it's, it's okay. It's fine. It's certainly good enough. Um, the motor and stuff is still all up in the air. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. Uh, but that's okay. Whether I buy another motor or I rebuild this one, which is sitting up on the bench now, which is the motor that came out of it. Uh, I sort of, I think I've worked out what the oil, uh, the water in the oil was. These have wet liners, uh, cylinder liners, and um, they push into the block and they've got sealant around the bottom. Now I'd say this is a 20 uh, year old bike and I'd say that the sealant's failed and it's just pouring water in through the bottom of the liners. So. Um, I, you know, it would be very, very rare, it's super rare on bikes to have a head corrode and, and, uh, and pour water like that. Uh, it's, it's more likely that you, uh, you know, sometimes you get it through the water pump on certain bikes like old K100s and things like that. But even then that's sort of far fetched because they have a, 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 a drain hole between the two, between the oil seal and the water seal on the water pump. So. But yeah, I don't know whether I'm going to be using this or another setup. And um, I'm happy about that because uh, I want the best setup I can get. If I can get, like, because I was going to turbo this. Now, I'll explain this because it's it's sort of a thing that sort of um, people sort of raise their eyebrows when I say I'm going to, uh, when I say I'm going to turbocharge it. Now, these motors were very, very soft. They had soft cams in them. They had a um, fairly low compression ratio and they weren't very powerful at all with the carbs on them. So, and I was, I thought, well, if I've got a soft motor, that's good. I can put a little bit of boost into it. And if I've got a good head gasket, it'll probably hold it without any problems, you know, get the rings properly and do all that sort of stuff and make sure the bottom end's nice and strong. Maybe even put a stronger set of rods in it. But what I found out since is that some of the Daytonas were well up over 120 horsepower straight out of the box. So if I can get a motor that powerful, I don't need to do a bloody thing to it. All I need to do is put it in and make sure the exhaust is breathing. You know, it gets plenty of exhaust out and the thing will fly. So I probably won't even have to tune it. Like 
Dynex unit or run a power commander or anything. And that would be the cheapest way to go, actually. So, yeah, there's that. And, uh, yeah, I... What else is there? Um, oh, the front end. Yeah, all the front end stuff came in. Hold on, just tick. Okay. So, um, set of uh, fork seals there, straight ahead. That's all that's in there. It's just a set of fork seals. In here is a... Uh, this is a bush kit. This has all the other O-rings, the bushes, the new clips, and whatever, crush washers. So, I mean, that's that's good. That gives me um, new stuff everywhere. I don't know if you've ever run into these before, but these are PD valves. Now, what you do with these is you put them in and they are a valving system for your front forks, meaning they're adjustable, uh, but you generally don't have to adjust them. They work pretty well straight out of the box. Uh, and um, what you do is, instead of having oh, sorry, instead of having the small one small hole through here, you drill them out so there's a ton of flow, and you let these do all the um, all the flow control on your uh, fork oil from the top to the bottom, and that gives you a damping on your front end. It's completely controllable both ways, which is a great great idea. It's basically like having a cartridge fork or at least something adjustable. You do have to pull them out to adjust them, unfortunately, but, I mean, at least you can adjust them. Most front ends now, Jesus, some of the front ends I've seen, some of the Chinese stuff I've seen come through, doesn't even have damper rods. They're just garbage. So, at the end of the day, I'm uh, with the shock rebuilt and, and uh, slightly heavier oil in it and um, new bushes and uh, valving in these, the, the springs on these, the length is right on them. They seem okay. Everything seemed pretty good. There wasn't any rust or anything like that in the front end, so any water or anything like that. So at the end of the day, these come up really nice, and I, I'm, uh, I think these are going to be fine, actually, once the front end's rebuilt, which won't take long. I've already... Uh, they did have a lot of um, brown inside the fork legs. I polished these as well. I think I showed you that last time. But yeah, uh, I got in there with a, a Scotch Bright on the end of the drill. You get in there with a, with a Scotch Bright and you clean them out completely. Get all the bloody brown rubbish out of them. They haven't been rinsed, these ones, but yeah. I've just got them upside down draining. But I, yeah, I'll wash them out with some, um, with some uh, shallot, uh, brake clean, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, they're good. Uh, new bolts everywhere, of course. New high tensile bolts. Uh, a lot of the time, you don't need stainless. Stainless is funny stuff. Um, hang on. I'll sit down. Stainless bolts are good. They, unless you buy like 316, which is the sort of top, the marine grade stuff. They're a bit harder and they tend to be a little bit, um, they, they, they tend to have, um, they don't rust at all. They won't have any sort of uh, staining on them. They'll stay pretty much the same all the way through. I don't buy them simply because they're a little bit hard and stainless has a tendency to work harden. And what work hardening is, if you've ever put a piece of steel into a vice and bent it backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, what happens is where it, where, it, where you're bending it, where it bends, it gets harder and harder and harder and then it snaps. Right now, that can happen to stainless forks, stainless spokes. Now, in the past fifteen years, they've got a lot better at making stainless, so it doesn't do that. But I still have, you know, I still put in stainless uh, spokes and they break. So you don't get that with high tensile mold, uh, high tensile steel spokes. Having said that, I mean, where it matters on the bike, where it actually has a lot of load on it. I mean, if you look at that top bolt. On the um, on the shop with the nylock nut on it, that's definitely a high tensile bolt. I wouldn't put a I wouldn't put a um, stainless bolt there. There's no need need to anyway. Stainless stuff is only really for when it's on display and you want it to stay nice and clean. And you bet you know you can polish it if it does sort of tarnish. That's the mainly the thing with it is that. Uh, the 304s and the 306s and things like that or whatever the grades are when you get 305s 
three or four is the main one that you get in the sort of in the less expensive um, uh, stainless bolts. You can polish them and they look fine. Uh, so I mean that's something. I mean once something's rusty, it's rusty, and especially uh, zinc plated bolts like. All those bolts that you saw on the ends of the forks and the triple clamps, they're all zinc plated high tensile bolts. Any cap screw that you buy, and a cap screw is like a, an Allen key bolt, you would probably call it. And now any Allen key bolt that you can buy is about as high a grade as you're going to get. They are high grade bolts and they, they're very good quality for the most part. All the stuff made in Australia is really, really good. Some of the stuff you see that comes in with Chinese tooling and that sort of, and Chinese parts, not that great, but the stuff that's made here is, is fantastic. It's good quality. So you just got to be careful where you buy bolts. I always use um, the fantastic A&M nuts and bolts. And they're like two minutes from here, so which is great for me. And they know me and they, they look after me. So I can just go in there with a list. And <laughs> some days, uh, yeah, I spend a lot of money there. But um, I, I like to keep everything here. It makes jobs go smoother like different lengths of bolts and the stuff that I go through regularly. So so putting this together, seeing as how it's, mu it's metric everywhere, um, like most European stuff, even though they're made in England, it's it's all metric. So um, it's not going to be a big hassle. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be scratching around for a bolt to put in the mudguard or some fucking thing. I'll have everything here, everything new. So... Um, Oh, another thing I can tell you about. Now, over here, you'll see, uh, right here. God, how do you do that? There. I'm doing all this backwards. See how I put dome head bolts here? It's because my ankles are going to be here, somewhere there. Wherever, on the side of the bike, on the side of the bike, where the, um, on the sides of these, right, where, you, where anyone's legs are going to be, Never, ever put a hex head bolt like that. Never. That'll tear your skin in a crash. You need to put anywhere on the side of your bike, a high tensile cup headed bolt like that, nice and smooth, and it'll just ride right over your jeans or your boots or whatever, and it won't cut you in half like a bolt will, like a, like a hex head bolt will. Very important, and not many people sort of uh, do that or notice it. Because until you've been in one, <laughs> you never know what's going to happen in a crash. And once you've been in a few, you, you start to think about things like that. So, yes, things like side stands and center stand, fucking, um, because they usually have a little leg on them so you can flick them down. Those sorts of things go right through you and it's not very nice. Yeah. So soft edges on a bike, wherever you're going to have your legs or your hands or anything like that. It's important. Um, that's about it.